Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Coach Matt, EliteThrowsCoaching.com, coming to you today from my very cluttered and messy office here at the gym. Uh, end of a very long day and just getting to my email, and I wanted to answer a question that came in by email. This was a very well articulated, very well thought out question. And it really got my brain moving trying to think of how I wanted to answer this. The the subject of the email is philosophical throwing questions. I really like these type of questions. A lot of times you just get, coach, how do I throw farther? Thanks. I don't really know how to answer that. But when you write me paragraphs and you write me a well thought out question, I'm going to read that stuff and I'm going to answer it here to help everybody else out. So this guy is a throwing coach in Ohio. I'm not going to say name or town or anything like that, but he sent me an email the other day. And basically what the email says is that he is a teacher. He is a high school football coach and a high school throwing coach. He played football in high school and in college, and he threw only in high school. Um, Basically, he has a head coach who is also a throws coach, so he's very lucky in that aspect. Um, But he had some observations, and basically what he said is that most of what he learned about throwing has come through observations, conversations with other coaches, and watching videos like mine that I do here on YouTube. And basically, he said that after reading some comments and responses following a recent video, he started looking at videos of world-class Uh, world-class shot putters who glide and he was trying to determine what they were doing the same or basically what they were being coached to do the same um, versus their individual idiosyncratic things that they do. Um, He wanted to see how much of the technique he coaches was showing up in the throwers and how much of it was like natural talent and things like that. And basically what this stems from because he is a football coach and he played football in college, he sees that professional level uh, football players, that their form and technique isn't always textbook like you would teach it to a younger, newer athlete, that their size and speed and athleticism kind of warrants that they can do things a little bit differently. Uh, And basically what he says is it leads him to these philosophical questions like, are they being coached to do it differently? Um, Or are they so physically gifted that this particular detail doesn't matter? Could they throw the shot put farther if they did things kind of more correctly, more textbook? Um, He's not really being able to find the answers to these questions, so he's wondering, what is our standard if not the best in the world? On which technical aspects is our time best spent to get the most return on the investment, the return on both the time and the physical investment of practice and training. Um, And he just says, thank you. He realizes it's a long email, all that good stuff. So I want to take a few minutes to go through this, kind of unbox this, but hopefully it's going to kind of give a general overall global idea of coaching and what it is that we exactly are looking for. These kind of philosophical throwing questions are going to get answered. Hopefully I'll touch on some things and give you guys some good answers. You still with me? You still following? Thank you. It's almost over, I promise. All right, so I want to take this kind of literally speaking from left field. Um, I want you to think of a different sport. So growing up, I played a lot of sports, and I'm 30, almost 39 years old. So one of the best baseball players from when I was growing up is a Hall of Famer, Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, Ken Griffey Jr., it can be argued, and I'm sure has been argued before, has probably one of the nicest uh, swings in Major League history. Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing has been idolized and has been copied, and people want to swing a baseball bat like Ken Griffey Jr. Um, But then when you look at something like Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing and say that that is sort of a textbook swing that people want to emulate, that people want to copy, and then you look at home run leaders of today you look at uh you know home run uh derbies at the all-star game not everybody swings like ken griffey jr not everyone is a carbon copy of ken griffey jr 
there's a lot of things that have to be present in everyone's swing, but then there's a lot of small things that are going to vary based on the size of the athlete, based on um, you know the size of the bat that they use, their strength, um, their experience, sort of their own personal ways that they like to do it. Okay, so that's why Ken Griffey Jr., even though he has the best swing in the past probably 30 years or 40 years, if you take a look back on it, um, he's not the all-time home run leader. Um, he's not the all-time RBI leader. At least I don't think. Maybe he is, but I don't think he is. Um, you know, he doesn't have, uh, for example, all of the, the batting titles. He didn't win a batting title every single year, even though he has the best-looking swing that a lot of people try to copy. So the other way to look at it, sticking with the baseball theme, my mentor in the business world um, is a uh, pitching coach and a um, kind of used to do a lot with Major League Baseball. And he always takes a look at another formidable baseball player, uh, Randy Johnson. So Randy Johnson has a book on pitching. And in this book on pitching, there's illustrations and there's techniques and there's explanations of how you should pitch. So one of it, Randy Johnson's a lefty. I'm not. I'm going to try to show you lefty. One of the pictures is literally somebody, it's almost like a cartoon figure with like a description throwing the ball kind of in this overhead motion, kind of coming across like you would throw a baseball, like a pitcher would throw a baseball. It's overhand motion. Well, when you turn to the cover of the book, it's Randy Johnson doing his like sidearm release kind of thing that he did for his entire career. So here's one of the most dangerous pitchers. Here's one of the best pitchers to ever play Major League Baseball. He writes a book and, and authors a book of how to pitch properly, and he doesn't even do that. Okay, um, There has to be certain things in a throw, and there has to be certain things in an athletic movement that need to be there. They absolutely positively need to be there, but they're going to differ quite a bit based on the athleticism and the individual idiosyncrasies of each individual athlete. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Here's another example that comes from another sport that I played most of my life growing up, which is basketball. Basketball has the layup. We all know, we've all heard that term before, before the layup. Okay, so what makes a layup a layup? Now, my son is in third grade, and he's just started playing basketball this year, and the coaches taught him how to do a layup. And if you're a right-handed athlete, and you're coming at the basket from the right side, certain things make up a layup. The most basic of those things is, number one, the ball has to go in the hoop, of course, but that you bank the ball off of the backboard and then it goes in the hoop. Also, you have to be close to the basket in order to perform the layup. You can go a little bit deeper and say, technically speaking, if you're coming at, as a right-handed athlete on the right side of the hoop, you wanna take off of your left leg. So left leg is the le left foot's the, left, the last foot on the ground. Left foot, right hand, layup. That's about where the definition of a layup starts, or I should say stops. You can get super technical with it and say, okay, layups, you need to be this many feet away from the basket. You need to be this many inches outside of uh, the paint. You know, you need to uh, shoot it with two hands instead of one hand. If you went underhanded, then that's not a layup anymore, even if it goes off the backboard. You can start making all of these rules but a layup is still a layup. Even if you go from the left side of the rim with your left hand and you take off of the right foot, it's still a layup even though it wasn't on the right side of the basket. Is it still a layup if you go from the underside of the basket and try to scoop it up and lay it up on the other side? Is that still considered a layup? That's when you start to get into these technical kind of things and you start to pick little things apart it doesn't take away from the fact that a layup is still a layup, even if you do it with two hands or underhand or one hand. 
Maybe you take off the wrong foot. Maybe you take off the right foot and shoot with your right hand. Is that still a layup? Absolutely. Technically, if you were to explain it to a coach, the proper way of doing a layup, well, no, you'd want a, your left foot, right hand. That's how people teach it. But it's still a layup. So I think that's one of the things that we have to look at is we shouldn't be trying to measure the glide that much. There are certain things that need to take place in the glide in order for it to be considered a glide. Um, there are sort of the 10 things I've been doing here on the channel recently. It's the top 10 corrections and mistakes of the glide. Now, you can say that there are corrections and you can say that there are mistakes, but in reality, even if some of those mistakes were being made, you would still consider it a glide. Um, now there is a glide that is done with a lot of mistakes and there's a glide that is done correctly and there are certain ways that you need to do a glide to see the best results out of it. But sort of like that layup, is the basketball going off the backboard and going in the rim? Yes. Does it still count for two points? Yes. Does it matter if you took off the left foot or the right foot? Uh, who really cares? The ball went in and you would still consider that to be a layup, okay? Um, that's, I think, where we need to start drawing the line. And it's kind of a blurry line, but that's where we need to start drawing the line of what's the best way to teach. The philosophical questions that the coach asked, you know, is would the top athletes in the world be throwing farther if they used textbook technique? The answer to that, in my opinion, is no. But should we be teaching our younger athletes textbook technique? The answer to that is absolutely. The same way that my third grade son has to learn the textbook way to do a layup, he'll figure out the best way after that. It's going to resemble that layup. Maybe not 100% of the way, if there was a way to even measure that. Maybe it's not 100% a textbook layup, but if it's 80% of a textbook layup and it still counts for two points and he still hits it 100% of the time, you know, if it's still a high percentage shot, then it's still worth doing, even though he's doing it a little bit wrong. You still with me? You still following? Thank you. It's almost over, I promise. All right, so let's pick on David Storl. I'm not picking on him. It's just I've used David in a lot of the examples that I've been talking about out there. Let's take a look at David Storl's te technique. And I mistakenly, and it drives me crazy, I mistakenly said Michelle Carter when we were talking about the double pump. It's not Michelle Carter. I don't know what my brain was doing that day. It's Valerie Adams. Valerie Adams is the one who double pumps like David Stahl double pumps and then throws okay so it's not michelle carter i don't think she's watching this video but if she is michelle sorry um it's not you it's me valerie adams does the double pump david storrell does the double pump michelle carter keeps that arm nice and long and uses it at the end so sorry to do that but let's take david Storrell for example okay so I don't even really know how to say this, but say the perfect, say the perfect way that you were to release the shot is that your toes are pointing right down the middle of that throwing sector, your hips are pointing right down the middle of that throwing sector, your shoulders are pointing right down the middle of that throwing sector, and the left arm comes around so it's perfectly even with your shoulder and then pulls in so it perfectly retracts your scapula in a way that allows the maximum amount of force to be pushed into that ball. Boom, textbook form, okay? So instead of being here, say before he pulls in, say David Storrell is here before he pulls in. Is it gonna go farther if he was here? Who's to say, no one really knows. But it goes really far here. If he starts pulling from here, instead of pulling from here, Okay, or if he starts pulling from here instead of pulling from here, it's still going to go really far. He's still going to be a silver medalist. He's still going to win a lot of international comp competitions. He's still going to be one of the best gliders who has ever lived. He's still going to throw that ball really, really damn far. Did it or was it perfect textbook technique if you had like a world-renowned uh, biomechanics professor, somebody who has 
literally the leader in the field of biomechanics takes a look at the shot and says, okay, well, you know, textbooks here, David Storrell's here, but for patient A, it would make more sense if he started pulling it in here and got a little bit more twist because of the height of his hips or the size of his rib cage or the width of his shoulders or the length of his arm or whatever it might be, then yeah, we can say, okay, that's perfect for him. That's perfect for everybody else. That's how David Stoll throws. And, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit different. So I guess what I'm trying to say in this is that you can't, it's not like a math problem. This is not two plus two equals four. Okay, this is not something that has a definitive answer. And I think that's what most people have come to the agreement on. This is not something that has a definitive answer. I mean, all you gotta do is look at this guy right here, Brian Oldfield, rest in peace. One of the funniest guys I have ever interacted with in my career as a track and field coach and, and all the other stuff I did before coaching, the selling the equipment and designing equipment. This guy was the man. And when you take a look at his technique versus maybe the technique of a Ryan Krauser uh, versus the technique of say Randy Barnes, the three of them look a lot different. But there's a lot of things that they do really, really well. And there's a lot of things that they do very, very similarly, similar, similarly to each other. And they both throw the heck out of the shot put, okay? So we're dealing with the former world record holder. We're dealing with Randy Barnes, who's the current world record holder. And then we're looking at Ryan Krauser, who hopefully very soon will be the new world record holder, the clean world record holder, which is what I would really love to see. Not an insult to any of these guys because it was a different day, it was a, it was a different time back then, but I'd love to see that clean world record. And then maybe people will look at Ryan Krauser and say, well, Ryan Krauser has the textbook technique. Well, Ryan's like six foot seven, six foot eight. So the technique that works for him might not work for a five foot 10 college freshman female. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit different, but you can start to take little parts of each throw and look throughout the generations of throwing and say, well, who threw the farthest? What did they do? What did they all have in common? And how does that um, sort of differ from that quote unquote textbook way of coaching? I think that's what you need to do is you need to kind of find that line and sort of use it as bumpers. That's kind of the way that it was best explained to me and it, it was in the weightlifting world is that you have certain exercises and certain limits to what you can do and sorry Ryan and it's like a bumpers you know it's sort of like when you go bowling and it's got bumpers if you have say for example perfect textbook technique here and you've got kind of not so perfect textbook technique here you kind of gonna go bumping between the two bump 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 you want to stay in the middle you want to stay as close to textbook as possible but you're going to be in the middle a lot of times and sometimes you might go too far one way boop and bump off and start heading the other way and boop bump off and start heading the other way boop and you, those bumpers are going to keep you in line those bumpers are going to keep you on the right path so who knows what that might be if this was that sort of a uh perfect say textbook um, spectrum where you have on one side is perfect textbook technique and on the other side is like ugh, not so good most of the top throwers out there are gonna be way down here they're gonna be sort of in this little like yeah right down here people on this side you know you might have that one freak with horrible technique that throws really far but that's sort of the outlier if you take a look at the top throwers in the world over the course of the past, let's say 40 to 50 years, all the different gliders out there that have won Olympic gold, whether they were using drugs or not using drugs, that's a different video for a different day. But you need to take a look and say, what are they doing that's the same? What are they doing that they all have in common? What are they doing that all has sort of the same things going on with it? And then try to get your athletes to do just that. So for example, if you take a look, do the gliders all start with their back flat to the ground? Do they all start with their head low and close to the ground? Yes. Now, does, um, for a little bit, of, let's go David Stoll again. All right. So David Stoll, maybe his head is like, you know, two feet, six inches off the ground. 
Valerie Adams head might be two foot three inches off the ground. Michelle Carter's head might be two foot eight inches off the ground. Ulf Timmerman might be three feet off the ground, but their head is still low to the ground. Okay, the head is still kind of below their 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 tailbone, if you want to look at it that way. Um, let's see, do they all drive? Is the heel the last part of their foot touching the back of the circle? Well, yes, it is. All right, but you know, is one person's knee at, you know, 135 degrees when the heel is touching the circle? Uh, is the other person at 140 degrees? Is the other person at 120 degrees of knee flexion? You know, when you start measuring that stuff, it doesn't really matter too much. What really matters is that they're pushing off the heel in the back. You know, it's the same thing with the turning of the foot. That's something that this gentleman mentioned in his email is that he noticed that Michelle Carter in Rio really was putting an emphasis on turning that power foot in midair. There's that classic slow motion shot looking down at the circle. She was really emphasizing turning that right foot and then completing turning that right foot, turning that right knee down the middle. But then you look at a Valerie Adams or you look at David Stoll or you look at... Um, why can't I think of his name? From Jesus, two-time gold medalist. Pop into my head. God, I'm so brain dead right now. I'm sorry. But you look at them and you say, well, they kind of push and turn the foot at the same time, or they push and roll on the foot a little bit, or they push and sort of pop and turn the right foot a little bit as they're throwing. Yeah, but they're, they're all getting their hips down the middle. Okay, so turning that right foot is a mechanism to get the hips down the middle. Whether or not you turn on the ball of the foot or the side of the foot or kind of lift and turn the foot or turn and lift the foot, you're still turning it. The foot's still pointing down the middle. The foot and the knee and the hip are still going down the middle. So if you start measuring the degrees or where the pressure is on the foot or anything like that, yeah, things are going to be different. But like that layup, it's all kind of going to be the same. All right, so you've got to look for not necessarily how the small parts of the throw are different. You've got to look at how the small parts of the throw are the same. You've got to teach your athletes the perfect textbook technique of how to do it correctly. And then they, like shooting a layup, they will find their way. If this is one end of the spectrum is perfect, the other end of the spectrum is not perfect, you want all of your athletes to kind of be like here, within like one or two degrees of perfect. You don't want them all the way over here kind of with crappy form and technique. So try to find the similarities to how the athletes are doing things correctly and try to instill that in your athletes by teaching proper form and technique. Proper form and technique is always going to be key. How certain athletes differ, especially the top athletes differ in the world over the course of the past 40 years, you can pick out tiny differences or big similarities. Focus on the big similarities, not the tiny differences, and you will see a more successful group of throwers that you work with. All right, so hopefully this solves that in a very roundabout, crazy way. You can see, I mean, look at Guys, I'm doing a PowerPoint for the New England Track Coaches Clinic. That's, that's what my notebook looks like. It is like, that's why my office here is such a mess. It is beautiful mind in here with just post-it notes and stickies and a bunch of stuff stapled on the wall. Not even tape. I just staple crap to the wall. Um, I can even show you my, I mean, I staple, it's not even a regular wall calendar, guys. It's a desk calendar and I staple those two foot by three foot sheets on the wall because I'm nuts. So you can see where my brain goes when a question comes in like this, but hopefully this explains to you kind of my thought process and gives you a better understanding sort of coaching on a global level of how we have to come at our throwers, teaching proper technique, perfect technique with the understanding that they're going to mess it up a little bit and they're going to do what feels best to them, but you always got to be trying to pull them back toward that perfect side so they're not going too far over to that kind of not so perfect side. All right. Thank you for the question. Keep sending them in. I hope you're all having a great track season. Spring is here. It's going to be here in a couple of weeks. And then before you know it, it's going to be June. Make sure, guys, check out the track and field overnight camp that I'm doing at Allegheny College out in Meadville, 
Pennsylvania. It's in Western PA near Erie and Cincinnati, Pittsburgh kind of area. It's right out there. Make sure to check that out. I'm going to have the stuff pop up right here at the end, as well as the playlist for our um, top 10 faults and corrections video, a subscribe link to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to click the notification bell. And then right down here, I'm going to be putting in the camp information. All right, click on that stuff. Let me know if you have any questions, visit the website, and I'll talk to you all real soon.